Yes. Okay. So let me go to the next case. Okay. Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? Sorry. Uh, 51 year old male presented after anterior dislocation of the right hip while playing sports. Um, I immediately see an anterior superior um, labral tearing. Um, I don't know if those are small paralabral cysts. There seems to be a like a defect of the uh, of the femoral head posteriorly, so like probably banged against the the anterior superior labrum there, kind of like a hill, uh, I guess a hill, uh, yeah, hill sex, yeah. yeah What's that? Hi, John. I, I want, wanted to know what's unusual about this case. No, not usual, of course. Ashu? Um, the fact that it's anterior dislocation? There you go. Yeah, the last one was posterior, which are much more common, right? Nine to, nine to one or 20, 19 to one. I, went, I saw one in my lifetime. Yeah. Good. Uh, let's see. Jennifer, what do you think of this case? <clears throat> okay, so here we have some axial images of the hip, and we have a history of recurrent posterior dislocations, and it looks like there's just diffuse blunting and irregularity of the posterior labrum, um, compatible with probably chronic tearing and blunting due to recurrent dislocations. There's a, what about the capsule back there? Um, I don't see a well-defined capsule, although there is some contrast injection. Okay. Hi, Michael. I think. Okay, and then here's a sagittal image. Okay, so we've circled this low signal intensity material on the posterior superior joint. I'm not sure if that's some displaced periosteum or no, displaced no. labrum. That's like, fracture. I, oh, I see. Okay. So that's a fracture, a chronic I, fracture. If I may add a little bit, before we had CT and, and MRI, um, there was a big discussion in orthopedics about how often you saw loose fragments after a dislocation and, and relocation. And of course, when you relocated it and everything fit well, uh, then and you didn't see fragments, everything was okay. But um, there was uh, one individual at USC, he operated on just about everybody um, because he felt that there was a, a, a fragmentation of the head and, and, and in, in every case. And he showed that there was like 90%, 80% uh, of hips with fragmentation. Um, I, uh, I never had to operate on a single one. All my Thanks. cases, but I had over 10. Um, uh, it had no fractures, um, and, and so I, I obviously didn't believe the guy. But uh, okay. So, so what do we, what do you think we're seeing here, uh, Jennifer? Um. Here it looks like there's some ossification there, but it should be where the ligamentum teres attaches. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah. So that this, in this particular case, this was ligamentum teres and some calcification. Uh, well, well, okay, uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Um. So it looks like there's maybe some thickening and edema involving the ligament and teres on the right. I think that's real. And it looks like there's maybe some reactive bone marrow edema as well. So I don't know if that's like a in, like an acute injury or if it's like a chronic 
traction thing, or it's probably just an acute tear or a partial yeah. tear. Yeah, this or is a partial tear, right? She can get good. John, what do you think the significance of these are? I, I don't think um, much at all. I, I, I don't know why it was our arthroscope. Um, maybe there was a lot of pain or whatever, but uh, I, I, I see no reason to arthroscope something that's calcified. Now, here, here might be a place to in, inject some cortisone if it was painful, okay. um, but not a lot. Not not five cc's. Okay. Uh, actually, in my my case. Okay. All right. So this patient has uh, left hip pain. Um, looking here on the left hip, on the on the uh, fluid sensitive sequence, it looks like there's a little bit more signal within the ligamentum teres, um, especially on the third set of imaging. Um, I'd be worried about a tear of the ligamentum teres. Um, on the axial imaging, um, you can definitely see it uh, a little bit more on the left side, uh, definitely more increased signal and thickening. Um, and uh, it looks like there's partial tearing there. Yep. Okay, uh, Jennifer. Uh, so here we have a 29-year-old male with FAI. Uh, it looks like these are some arthrogram images of the left hip, and there is some increased signal along the superior labrum, but I don't see any full thickness extension through the labrum. Yeah, there may be a, a small cam-type lesion there at the femoral head and neck junction, and then, I mean, there is some thickening of the well, ligamentum teres. Yeah, this is probably a little bit of a marginal osteophyte. The true cantap okay. lesion would actually be more anterior than this. And then we see some thickening of the uh, ligamentum teres. It's 29-year-old. Uh, what, yeah. was, was there trauma involved in this fellow? Uh, I think he was an athlete. So he's had repetitive traumas. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And then, uh, so they did an arthrogram, probably injected a little bit up here. Uh, and then here we can see the ligamentum teres, and this is what it looked like under the arthroscope. Uh, Jennifer, oh. what, what, what do you think is going on? Uh, well, I think there's a, at least some partial thickness tearing. It looks like some of it still remains intact. Yeah. Uh, uh, but there's a lot of fibers there that are detached yeah. and irregular. Right. Exactly. tissue. So this is kind of a chronic partial tear of it, of it here. And here's a, here's a, another case where you can see abnormal signal intensity within the ligamentum teres here. And, uh, another uh, chronic degenerative tearing and and it's a similar you know all these ligamentous structures are similar structures throughout the body uh, so that looks a lot like the mu mucoid degeneration that we see in the anterior cruciate ligament it's really the same kind of, of pathology as we see in the acl so michael what do you think of this one Okay, um, 25 year male, right hip pain after the massage. Um, I'm in the right hip. I don't know if I'm seeing too much on x ray. Now I'm seeing there's quite a bit of edema in the superior acetabulum, kind of all throughout the entire acetabulum, and maybe some signal in the uh, teres ligament. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of edema throughout that. So I don't know if I see a discrete fracture. It's kind of hard to tell in those upper images. There's kind of some dark signal. I'm not really sure. It's kind of, can't really tell. But yeah, there's just kind of diffuse acetabular marrow edema. Um, and that ligamentum tear is like thickened. So 
yeah. uh, like thickened and globular kind of. And it's it kind of displaced and separated. And then there's all this bone edema as well uh, due to, to probably had a dislocation at the time of the Thai massage. Well, that sounds uh, kind of intense. What do you say about chiropractors when they this, well, when they uh, yank on the hip, uh, uh, using the knee as a lever arm. Uh, I wonder what the difference between that and the thigh massage is. Yeah, really. really. And I haven't seen that many. Whatever it is, thank you. I I, I don't want any. Yeah, right. Probably I had a case in uh, propaganda case in residency. Uh, a guy, it's not in this K exactly, but he uh, um, he uh, occluded a uh, chiropractor occluded this 34 year old guy's uh, vertebral artery, and he got a stroke and lost eyesight. Yeah, I, I, I see. I've seen, of, I've seen a fair amount of chiropractic injuries to the spine, but I I haven't seen one to the hip, but. I, I can certainly see where they could certainly cause injury. Uh, yeah. I've seen some real bad news stuff. I, and... Yeah, I bet you have, Joe. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this one? I think it's... Uh, oh, your turn. My, go ahead, Ashley. Uh, all right, go ahead. 30-year-old um, female runner with chronic groin pain. Um, uh, first thing I noticed is there's a lot of signal within the ligamentum teres. Um, and then the other thing I noticed was in the posterior labrum, it almost looks like there's a, I don't know, some separation there. I don't know if that's just a sublabral foramen, but I don't think you see that posteriorly. I think that's an injury. Yeah, yeah you do see. This, this is a common finding. You can see posteriorly. Okay. If you look for it, you'll see it quite a bit. Okay. And then, and then this is really a, uh, a defect here at the junction of the labrum and articular cartilage, most of these, especially when they're nice and smooth like this, are just thought to be congenital variants. Uh, okay. it's, it's too smooth and not irregular enough to be abnormal. This was a, uh, and here's a CT arthrogram in this same patient. We can see okay. a little bit of contrast going into the ligamentum. Through the this, ligament, yeah, so the ligament's torn again, partially yeah. torn. Right. And they actually went in and did a repair procedure, put in a graft. I wonder why. Well, here they say there is a partial chondrolabral detachment, uh, which you know, may, I guess may be the case. But most of the time, in my experience with these kind of changes of the labrum, at least uh, the arthroscopists around here will will call these normal variants. It, it looks normal to me, John, but yeah. they were operating on the ligamentum teres, weren't they? Yeah, they put a graft in for the ligamentum teres. I've never seen that uh, here. Oh, where is this in Russia? Uh, this is in Spain. I figured it wasn't in America. Okay, Jennifer. All right, a 38-year-old arborist slipped down a hill with a heavy load. Uh, we can see that there is a right hip effusion. Um, What's this? Well, yeah, it looks like there's disruption of that inferior capsule. There's the T1. Uh, here, here again, there's irregularity, and it looks like disruption of the inferior capsule. Yeah. So, so what it's structure like, goes across here inferiorly, right, right the here? Ischiofemoral. It's called the transverse. It's called the transverse ligament. Transverse ligament. Okay. So, the, so, you have a labrum up above here, but when you go to the inferior aspect of the uh, acetabulum. Uh, there is no labrum. It's it, uh, the the bone stops down here, and you have a ligamentous uh, attachment between the bones, which stabilizes the inferior aspect of the joint, and it's called the transverse ligament, uh, which was torn in this particular case. We can see the tear of the transverse ligament here. To, to give you some uh, 
information in case you didn't uh, know about uh, a fellow who said that transverse ligament is as hard as bone. The extremely, extremely strong structure, fortunately for us. So usually when, when there's a dislocation, the ligament doesn't tear. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty unusual to see it tear because of its uh, very, very sturdy uh, development. Yeah, this is one from Philip Terman. I'm not, I don't remember directly seeing one myself. Well, I can imagine oh, it happening, one. Yeah. <laughs> movement and tw twisting injury of some kind. Yeah. That's a bit unusual. Right. Uh, so, Michael, what do you think of this one? Uh, this one year old male with left hip pain and clicking. Assume we're like looking in the region of the transverse ligament. On the T1, it looks pretty thickened and kind of indistinct. And on the this is fluid sensitive sequence, it looks a little bit bright and also a little indistinct and kind of thickened. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know. It looks like it's intact though. And is this the same day? Yeah, this is the same is exam. Okay, because then we see that the ligament looks intact, but there's a lot of surrounding kind of a uh, diminished signal. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if it's just like strain let of it see. or if it's actually oh, it's, torn. It's a different one. Well, let, let me see here. Okay, there. Because on the next yeah. image, this looks like there's still intact transverse ligament. There's just quite a bit of fluid around it. Right, and then here we can see. But there's fluid side. underneath it as well, kind of outside the, yeah. the chronic tear of the transverse ligament. Capsule yeah. and there was a uh, synovial membrane in this area also, so. Yeah, um, which is thickened here. Okay, Ashu. Um, okay, so 31 year old male with acute onset pain three weeks ago. Um, they wanted to. Uh, Look it up for a loose body. Um, well, that's, I can't rule out a loose body because I see a, a loose body there superiorly. I don't know if that's from a prior acetabular fracture. Um, so, so, so what do you think well, this is from? Um, yeah, it looks like that there is a, a fracture of the uh, anterior superior portion of the acetabular rim. Yeah. And so it's an old fracture. Good. Okay. It, it's, uh, nice and, it's nice and smooth. Uh, so you figure it's a uh, chronic. Right. Yep. Jennifer. So here we have some coronal images of the bilateral hips, and there's some marrow edema along the left superior femoral head and neck junction. I think this may reflect osseous contusion, or yeah, I guess it could reflect remote injury. Yeah, this looks like there might be some cortical irregularity. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Michael. Okay, thirty-four-year-old female hip pain two weeks after fall. Um, so there's uh, some subcontral edema in the superior acetabulum. There's also some edema involving the uh, Terry's uh, ligament, I believe. Um, you know, we we're talking about the transverse ligament previously. I think down there in the inferior looks okay. So um, I don't know if that's either just degenerative signal in the acetabulum or if that's, or I guess they're 34, so this is probably going to be like acute trabecular injury. I don't see a discrete fracture line. Uh, initial improvement on crutches, symptoms worsened with physical therapy. Now it looks pretty, the edema looks more demarcated. Um, on there and actually now I'm wondering if I see like a small little there's a little bit of cartilage defect and then I'm wondering if I see almost like kind of like a subtle line kind of a vertical fracture line almost yeah you can kind of see it on this image better there's like it looks like it progressed and there's been like chondral loss um, I don't know if this just yeah yeah so here we have a deep fissure and we see a little bit of a Fluid collecting deep. Like a big osteochondral injury and maybe kind of like a non displaced, you know, trabecular yeah. fracture now. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's a, now it's a chronic osteochondral injury. 
Right. So you can get a little information that is not written up. Charney, the fellow that invented the total hip, uh, well, at least uh, he's the one that developed one that finally worked after 100 Teflon establisher uh, cases fell apart on him in, in within a year. No. Uh, he came up with uh, with a proper uh, polyethylene cup. But anyway, uh, Charlie would not have physical therapy come near his patients. He had two nurses walking his patients. Uh, the reason that uh, in those days you didn't put weight on the hip and you still don't do it today uh, is because of cement that he used. Um, you, you don't put uh, immediate weight bearing on, on folks that uh, have a cement, cemented prosthesis. Uh, you do uh, if, if you uh, put in um, uh, uncemented prosthetics. Right. So it was kind of interesting. Charlie uh, used to see a uh, uh, like a devil uh, uh, seeing a cross uh, when it came to therapists. He, he, mm. he just, uh, may, maybe he blamed uh, the, the, all his Teflon cases. Uh, yeah, all his failures. Their, you know. Yeah. But it was just a bad, um, bad material to use in a hip. Mm. Just, Good. Right. Not like frying eggs. Wow. Ashu, what do you think of this one? Uh, so, 14 year old with sports injury, real left femoral neck fracture. Um, the femoral neck is fine. There's a lot of edema. I think there's a posterior rim fracture of the acetabulum here. Yeah. It's pretty extensive. There's a lot of edema of the acetabulum as well. There might be additional fracture lines that extend through the acetabular rim. Um, yeah, it's just completely detached there and distracted. Close to your rim fracture. A big fragment. Yep. Mm -hmm. And here's an old, an old injury that, that healed with a little ossicle there and deformity and osteophyte formation. So here's some studies that have been published relatively recently. What is the value of steroid injection in patients with osteoarthritis-related hip pain? Uh, so this is chronic uh, hip pain with cartilage loss and osteophyte formation. And this study showed that there is no short or long-term uh, therapeutic improvement uh, with steroids for chronic degenerative disease of the hip. Okay. Uh, I second that. Yeah. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this one? Okay, 23-year-old NHL player, severe pain, real sports hernia, and or distal rectus tear. So the images we see, so you Pretty good edema in the bilateral uh, pubic bones across the pubic symphysis, which looks, the cortical margins look fairly irregular for a 23 year old. Yeah. Um, so you're worried something like osteitis, you know, pubi uh, pubis or symphysis pubitis. Yeah, it's uh, called a lot of things. I, I like to describe it, but basically say in the report that it's due to chronic repetitive injury. Trauma. So it's clear what the mechanism is, which is kind of what's opening. A lot of people will, you know, will call call it inflammatory disease of some sort, but it's repetitive trauma. And here's another more chronic example where you can see sharp demarcation between the edema, a little bit of capsular thickening of the symphysis pubis, uh, but the the bone is actually pretty well maintained in this particular case. Uh, Here's just another example where here we can see fluid within the symphysis pubis, marked thickening of that anterior capsule uh, in, in this patient. Uh, let's see, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this? Uh, 43 year old male runner and rock climber with groin pain, rule out sports hernia. Um, you can see a, a lot of signal and hypertrophy to that capsule at the symphysis pubis some irregularity there. There's also some increased signal on the left within the pubic ramus. And um, I don't know, there could be some, yeah, it looks like, I don't know if the capsule is even intact anteriorly. Um, yeah, it probably is, but you have a lot of uh, erosive changes 
and bone irregularity at the symphysis pubis. And this is another symphysis pubitis. And this, these erosive changes are due to chronic instability there. After the injury, it starts becoming a little bit less stable. Okay, Jennifer. All right, this is a 32-year-old female with marked pelvic pain after recent vaginal delivery, inability to adduct thighs, rule out structural abnormality. Uh, we can see that there is widening of the pubic symphysis and fluid signal intensity. Uh, so I think this is concerning for acute injury, capsular injury of the pubic symphysis. Right. And there's edema within the bilateral adductor muscles. Yeah. Is it caused by uh, delivery or is it caused by um, just uh, the anatomy of pregnancy? Uh, well, some of this, I think, could be caused during pregnancy, but then this looks more acute with acute widening and muscle edema. Um, I the, the, delivered over 300 uh, babies. I took an externship in GYN will be in the, and I think John's gonna show some more of these. Uh, it's, it's nothing unusual about uh, uh, this kind of a situation in, in, in eighth and ninth, ninth month of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be reversible. Uh, I don't think I remember anybody complaining about um, uh, the pain other than the, the epiphysi army. I, I don't think I'm pronouncing it correct. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Michael. Where's my help? Episiotomy, thank you. Episiotomy, got it, that's it. I couldn't get it either, good. Michael. Okay, um, so 33-year-old uh, female, one day after vaginal delivery, so we see kind of marked widening of the uh, pubic symphysis. Yep. So I just found that this is another case of uh, diastasis. So uh, again, the, the, the anatomy of the bony structures around the hip is really pretty complicated. There are a lot of muscles. Uh, it just shows how important it is to be able to have the ability to fine tune motion and control motion of the hips, uh, as you all know. And uh, as humans developed, uh, what, what really gave the human race its uh, distinctive advantage in the animal world was it was the human's ability for long distance running and uh, in order to do that uh, you really be upright just on two legs as opposed to all fours it requires a lot of control of the hip and therefore the hip musculature is fairly complicated in order to be able to maintain proper balance and so as there are, there are a lot of different areas we won't go through all of this as i, I think you're all pretty well aware of it, but there are, that's why there's so many different muscles uh, around the hip so that you really have fine control over hip motion uh, uh, movements. Uh, let's see, Michael, you did the last one, right? Yes, but so, it was just like a repeat case. You want to take this one then? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, so what's the history on this? Uh, left left hip pain. Left hip pain, okay. Um, before we get to left hip and the right hip, I see like an area of serpiginous increased signal in the femoral head. Like I'm wondering if there's some AVN over there. And the left hip, I, I wonder if I see something similar, but with like marked degree of edema involving the femoral head and femoral neck. Um, and then there's also a lot of muscular edema up in the gluteus musculature. Um, And on this, uh, so the left femoral head looks, you know, there's some abnormal marrow signal, maybe some actually bony remodeling. Like, I wonder if there's some collapse actually happening if you look posteriorly. Yeah. So, so it's collapse you, or in, indentation. So, Michael, let me ask you this. What is sarcopenia? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, sarcopenia is, I mean, when you have like mus muscle atrophy. Yeah, it's really severe and, fat replacement of the muscles, right? And so when you look at this one, I mean, all their muscles are all markedly atrophic, and they're low volume, and they've got you know fat throughout them. Right, right. So, so is the edema up there like, you know, like kind of acute? Uh, yeah. So, kind of so muscle what, loss what happens then? <clears throat> and this is a, a really kind of common cause of kind of body pain is. When you get severe replacement of muscle by fat, the muscles become very friable and very weak. And a kind of minor activity that most people would just think is just normal activity can produce muscle tears and weakness can produce pain. And the inability to properly control bones, which leads to increased risk of falling or just increased risk of bone injuries, because most of these patients are also osteopenic. Got it. Uh, and that's really what we're we're dealing with in someone like this. And it's a number of studies have now shown that for older individuals, uh, there is substantial improvement both in life expectancy as well as as uh, feeling of uh, 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 well being uh, for a, a lot of older individuals to be involved in in weight training programs to try to keep the muscles become, from becoming severely atrophic like this. Uh, chronic uh, alcoholism, which is 50% of cases uh, for AVN, mm -hmm. uh, may be a contributing factor to this by a patient uh, laying on one side and uh, not waking up for uh, 12 to 24 hours. Uh, and and then putting pressure on the muscles so, uh, to where they lose the blood supply, et cetera. Uh, I, I've always thought that that might be one of the problems for this kind of a condition. Yeah. Okay. Am I right on that? I don't know. I, uh, I never. It's, it's, I think I think that's. Uh, I think you you are right. Yep. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, well, there's a significant atrophy of the right side of gluteal musculature kind of throughout, so I'd be worried about a chronic tear or just um, yeah, yeah an injury. A, a lot of subcutaneous fat. And, oh. and, and you can see the tear here. I think there's not a good attachment to the gluteus medius, and I think it's torn. And here there's some partial tearing on the, on the left side as well. Right. And here there's severe bilateral asymmetry and the degree of uh, muscle atrophy. And uh, th this was thought to be, just like you said, asymmetric atrophy uh, due to chronic tearing of the gluteus medius tendons and therefore a loss of use and, and then you get more, more atrophy. And uh, gluteus medius tears are a significant problem. It used to be called trochanteric bursitis but now it's been much better recognized with MR that the majority of these really aren't inflammatory changes of the bursa. They're really tears of the gluteus minimus and medius attachments. And in these people with uh, severe sarcopenia and very poor quality tissues, it's extremely difficult to treat. Because even if you go in surgically, these, these uh, tendons don't heal very well. Uh, they, they're just very tendonotic and therefore there's a very poor healing response. And so it becomes a very difficult thing to treat. And a lot of these people become bedridden, which is, and then just makes everything worse. With uh, Charlie's technique that he came up with in the 60s um, to do a total uh, hip replacement with Charlie's instrumentation, uh, all the trochanters were removed and then replaced. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some people uh, removed the, the muscle rather than uh, mm. uh, than the trochanter and couldn't uh, and and had a hell of a time to try to re put it, put put the muscle and the tendon back on bone. It's virtually right. impossible, and uh, these these folks really suffered. Uh, that's why Charlie. Uh, when he came up with his procedure, 
you had to go to his place uh, and visit with him and and scrub with him uh, and maybe watch him do the surgery hands on um, before you were allowed to use cement. Uh, that was restricted in the United States. You had to visit him and get a certificate uh, to be able to do a total hip. Um, I was lucky. I was at UCLA then as a chief resident, and I got to do total hips before just about anybody else in town. Good. My chief went there, and uh, he knew Charlie. Yeah. Uh, uh, he uh, left uh, the UCLA and did nothing but hips thereafter. Medicare yeah. paid five thousand dollars a hip. Oh my God! I'm sorry, yeah. four thousand. He charged five thousand. Hmm. So just... now they now they pay fifteen hundred. Yeah. So here's where a lot of the different tendons, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few of these, especially the rectus femoris, uh, I think later in this lecture. But there's where a lot of the different uh, tendons and so forth uh, insert. Okay, uh, and I don't remember who is last. Mm, I think I might be next. Okay, Jennifer. Uh, so we have a fall with left hip pain, and it it looks like we're pretty anterior here, and there's edema within that left superior pubic ramus, and it looks like there's some fracture there extending through the ramus, concerning for acute fracture of the uh, superior pubic ramus. Um, not sure here if we're seeing another fracture in that inferior pubic ramus. Can't tell exactly where we are. Certainly a lot of edema in the, in the abductors here. Here we can see the. This is a tear of the abductor. Uh, I'm sorry, the obturator. See there. Yeah. Here's here's one on the opposite side. So it tears. Pelvic yeah, injuries. I think you'll notice. I don't know how many cases you have, John, but. Um, extremely extremely common yeah and here's Not another obturator tear okay uh michael okay left hip pain after injury um so it looks like we have signal I believe that's in one of the adductor muscles on the left. Yeah. It goes back oh, here. So it's probably one of the external rotators of the of the hip on the left side. Yeah. Or that's still the obturator turn, so we're still above it. Okay. Yeah, so just another another muscle tear. Okay, this was a major league baseball player. There's a right-handed pitcher and felt a tear and, and pain. Uh, let's see, uh, that's you. So this is mm -hmm. usually in pitchers or outfielders after they uh, do kind of a maximum effort at throwing. Typically it's an outfielder who doesn't throw hard all the time and then has to make a throw into home plate to try to catch somebody stealing or or trying to steal an extra base. Didn't see much in football. Um, okay, so uh, it's looking uh, along the left side, it looks like there's some edema there um, in one of the muscles there. Yeah. Um, it's like an internal oblique muscle or... Yeah. So this is an oblique, uh, obliquus muscle uh, down here, and fairly or truly over the, the abdomen, a common location, and here we see it also. And, and, and this is an obliquus tear, uh, which, uh, you know, we, I guess we've, we've seen a couple the last couple of weeks, actually, but it's uh, a reasonably common injury in, 
and uh, baseball players. And so we, we actually have a protocol for baseball players, which are kind of, it's a, a rib, uh, it's, we call it a chest wall protocol, but it's really a protocol specifically looking for tears of the obliquus muscles there. So we don't need to go through all of this. And these are, it's, uh, occur where the muscle reinserts in the rib or costal chondral inches. It's usually, it's usually around the T10 uh, in the midline on the, on the side of the dominant side of throwing. So that's uh, almost always where you look for it. Uh, Jennifer. Uh, so this is a 17-year-old two weeks <clears throat> after sports trauma evaluate a painful mass. Um, I can't tell how deep we are if we're in the rectus pretty, femoris. Pretty, super, pretty superficial. We're anterior okay. we're at the symphysis pubis, and this is the rectus femoris on the left yeah. side. Okay, so we can see that there's a fluid collection there with some surrounding muscular edema. I think this is probably an, a tear of the myotendinous junction of the rectus femoris, probably a grade two injury. Um, there is some partial tearing of the muscle fibers there. It looks like an intramuscular hematoma and think, perhaps some partial thickness tearing of the muscle. I think this is the kicker for the USC football team. And this is large intramuscular hematoma due to a grade two tear uh, of the uh, uh, rectus femoris. He actually continued playing with this. They eventually uh, aspirated this, thinking that it might heal faster if they aspirated it. Uh, but then he, he had to stop for a couple of weeks. But he was back on a full rotation seven weeks after this. Yeah, and that's a little unusual. Um, one of the problems with uh, these injuries is uh, myositis or cystic cancer. Yeah. And uh, that can disable somebody for months. So mm -hmm. you have to be very careful in how you treat these. And uh, of interest is anti inflammatory medication, i.e., ibuprofen. Uh, you probably leave is probably not a good idea because of its. Uh, Hematologists, uh, hematological, um, being a, uh, not only an anti-inflammatory but um, causes, causes hematomas. Uh, you don't want to use that. So, um, but um, uh, ibuprofen is on a regular basis and and a gentle. Exercise is the way to go with these cases. Myositis ossificans of the thigh can really ruin somebody's uh, career. Right. Good, John. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Michael, abdominal wall pain after a tennis serve. Okay. So it looks like there's this circumscribed collection deep along the rectus abdominis. I assume right after a tennis serve, this might be like a, a tear with big hematoma. That's so what I'd assume. Um, and now we can see yeah, that there's this um, irregular collection involving the left rectus abdominis kind of deep too. So this is a pretty significant abdominal wall tear. Yeah, and you're starting to get a little bit of oxyhemoglobin around the edges. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a big hematoma. Okay. And this kind of gets us the area of what's called sports hernias, which a better term for this is athletic pubalgia. Uh, but, but basically, these are injuries. They can be acute or they can be due to chronic lower grade injuries in the area of the symphysis pubis. And they tend to involve the rectus abdominis a distal insertion, like this last case, adductor thigh injuries, and by far the most common is the adductor longus. 
uh, uh, all uh, uh, symptoms of pubis injuries, and then occasionally you can have uh, symptoms coming from remote disease. But you're primarily looking first and foremost for a Dr. Longus and a Dr. Magnus injuries on the side of symptoms, and they typically uh, the tendon pulls off its attachment to the uh, to the uh, pelvis right next to the symphysis pubis. Uh, injury of symphysis pubis or injury of the rectus abdominis. So we typically like to get coronal images, especially uh, fluid sensitive images, usually PD fat sat or stirs, where we get the distal end of the rectus abdominis, but also, and I like to center this differently so that you can see more distally because it's quite common for these injuries to involve the adductor magnus or the adductor longus and extend quite a ways inferior uh, to the groin area. So you really want to center uh, much lower than on this particular image. Here we can just see an injury to the rectus abdominis on the, on the right side. Uh, what's in interesting, uh, um, actually a, a, a trainer came up with a uh, Using right. the word hernia, it does not fit the definition of a hernia. Right. And uh, but interestingly enough, uh, it's now in the orthopedic literature uh, as if it's a real uh, hernia. Really? Uh, kind of interesting. Hmm. Interesting. So, so uh, let's see. Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? A uh, 16 year old son of an orthopedist with chronic right lower abdominal pain. Yeah, he was a tennis um, player. Tennis player, okay. So at the right and left, um, looks like, I don't know if this is a real finding or if we're just kind of oblique. Um, it looks like the distal rectus femoris is kind of attenuated. Well, it's um, normal on the left and it's abnormal on the right. Okay. Oh, so it's abnormal on the right. So it's, I guess it's a little, it's a little irregular and thickened it, there. It's markedly thickened, just like if you the medial, the old medial collateral ligament injuries, you can see thickening of the medial collateral ligament or the ATFL. Same thing. Uh, this mm -hmm. is really the the distal rectus abdominis tendon is really kind of nice and thin and broad distally where it attaches to the symphysis pubis. Uh, this is uh, evidence of prior injury. And this was a chronic injury from, from tennis. You notice also that the rectus abdominis muscle is a little bit uh, more atrophic on the side of the injury than it is on the opposite side. There was a time before uh, our modern technology that, that uh, chronic appendicitis was a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, we now know that that doesn't exist as far as uh, I know. Um, but in the, in the past, that was uh, one of the diagnoses used and operated on. Mm. Uh, and they used to count in a hospital how many cases a general surgeon uh, did where the appendix was normal at, uh, at the laparotomy. Uh, mm. It was a kind of an interesting situation in the past. Interesting. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer. Okay, so we have a 31-year-old NHL player with groin pain. We can see some coronal images through the pubic symphysis. There's some trace edema along the left aspect of the pubic symphysis, and then there is some increased signal and fluid signal there at the bilateral attachments of the adductor longus, uh, greater on the left. Okay. I think this could be concerning for um, athletic pubalgia. Okay. And uh, so this is an 11, 28, 11. Kind of subtle, maybe a little bit of signal there, but didn't seem to be much to write home about, except these guys don't complain of pain much. And uh, this particular diagnosis is very common in professional hockey players, put a lot of stress on this area when they skate. So this was 11, 28, 11. I came back with increasing pain on 1, 7, 2012. So two months later. Okay, so now there's disruption of that right adductor longus with fluid signal and probably some hemorrhage compatible with complete tear um, at the insertion. Right. And then here we can see the tear here. Yeah. 
So uh, when these hurt, you know, the, the, the people need to uh, uh, give them some attention. If you just forget about them and play through the pain, this is the sort of thing that, that can happen, is that they can, they can uh, make, be made considerably worse. Okay, uh, say Michael. Okay, um, so grim pain after sport. So it looks like somewhat similar to the one Jennifer just took. There's a lot of muscular edema and kind of fluid surrounding the left pubis involving the adductor muscles. It looks kind of irregular, like right there where their mouth is right above yeah. that dark area, like if it's actually torn and retracted, I'm wondering. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. if there's like a full thickness tear. This is the left adductor longus, and it's completely torn yeah. off and with it's, attachment yeah. there to the bone. A little bony change there as well. This is what it looked like on the axial images. On here again, we can just see the you know fluid cleft and the irregularity and retraction. Hockey players are masochistic. <laughs> right. I played uh, hockey once upon a time, but not at this level. Yeah. I just see something here. I think we were tough yeah. in those days, but uh, <laughs> when we see the MRI, I mean, like. Right now, I, it's a different ball of wax. Right. From the so, streets. So there, there have been a number of classification for muscle tears. <clears throat> well, one is the British classification, where they claim that these different uh, uh, grades of the classification actually correspond with how long it takes before the, the uh, athlete can get back into play. So they have a grade zero, which is kind of muscle soreness with a normal MR. Grade one, small oh. tears with fascial edema less than five centimeters in length uh, and small uh, areas of edema in the musculotendinous junction. Grade two is moderate muscle tear where you have uh, involvement of more than 50% of the thickness of the muscle uh, in the cross-sectional area and the edema really extends in also into the tendon. And then the grade three is uh, larger tears, almost complete full thickness tears and then full thickness tears. Uh, most people in the United States don't use this classification system. The classification system that usually uses is grade uh, one, two, and three. For grade one, you see edema within the muscle fibers, but uh, and often you, it, if you get kind of a feathery appearance as the edema goes between the fibers, but you don't have any focal fluid collections. Grade two, you get a focal fluid collection. In the acute setting, it's usually a hematoma, but some fibers are still around. And then grade three are complete tears. Uh, and then what, what they found with uh, the British classification system uh, is that most of the tears were, were low grade, though uh, the next most common was a complete tear. And then return to play using the different grades. Uh, with the low grade, it's usually one to two weeks, uh, but much, much longer with, with higher grades. I'd rather go clinically. Yeah. But, uh, only what a, a lot of people will ask about now in the athletic population really is it a grade one, two, or three? And then if it's a grade three, you have to determine whether it's the muscle or whether it's the tendon that's torn. Uh, as you all know, if it's a, the, the tear is at the tendon bone interface, that's generally considered surgical. If the tear is in the muscle or at the muscular tendon instructions, it's generally considered non surgical. Uh, Let's see. I don't remember. I forgot who was lo who was last. Location is important too, John. Some cases you just cannot operate on. Oh, good. Yep. Ashu, what do you think of this one? Um, I'm just looking at the left side. The adductor longus looks looks like the muscle has a lot of fluid in it. I, I don't. I would call this a grade two. A lot of grade two tear. Um. I'd like to scroll through to see if the tendinous yeah. attachment is still well, intact. Here's what it looks like it's here. firmly within the muscle. Yeah, and this is this is actually probably a grade one. We'd have to see all the images, but I, I don't remember. I don't think this one had a frank big collection in it. I think it was just a, a grade one partial tear. Let's see, Jennifer, why don't we uh, finish the day on this case? This was an all-star hockey player. This was in December of 2006, and he had groin pain. What do you think? Okay. Uh, so here in December I, I, 2006. I think, 
think I think this might have been the year that uh, that uh, I think this was the uh, I think this is the year that we won the Stanley Cup. But go ahead, keep going. Okay. I I see some intramuscular edema within that left adductor longus, um, but I there is a little bit of edema there at the attachment to the pubic symphysis. Yeah. It could reflect some stress reaction. I don't see a it's tear. Subtle. Yeah, it's pretty subtle here, but this is where he was symptomatic. That's on 1226. This is now uh, three months later. These are axial images okay. right through that same area. So now there's a fluid signal intensity at the expected attachment with some some retraction concerning for a tear of the yeah. adductor. And then there's also some adjacent intramuscular edema. Right, and here you can see the typical grade one kind of signal with the, the edema in between the fibers. But here I'm concerned that it could be of a little avulsion of the tendon from the bone. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, interstitial edema doesn't mean that it's uh, what, what one would call a tear. I, I don't understand um, the reason for the uh, one, two, three, other than like the tendon um, um, partial injury and then incomplete tear and then complete tear. That that that's that makes sense. But yeah, I think uh, muscle, on the muscle is. Uh, uh, I suppose you can use the same numbers, but okay. uh, I, I, I don't remember using them in, in my reports. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, this is the coronal uh, PD fat cell. Um, yeah, so I think this is at least a high grade partial tear at the origin, if not a near complete tear. Okay. And there's that fluid signal intensity okay. cleft. And this signal right here between the symphysis pubis and the adductor longus tendon is called the secondary cleft sign. So, Jennifer, uh, that was an interesting way you put it, high grade partial tear. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so Jennifer, now this is, this. Well, let's see, this is, sorry, 32307. And then now we're in, we're two weeks later. Okay, so this looks worse to me. I'd call this a complete tear and their surrounding hemorrhage and increased fluid and intramuscular edema. So it looks like it's worse. There's more retraction now of the attachment. Like That's I said, there has And he's still playing, still playing a professional hockey. And then, then they went into the playoffs and he played mostly through the playoffs, but in the, the last final round, he wasn't able to play. It just got too much. That was yeah. Wow. So, and here's just, now here's uh, another hockey player. This time it's not a tear of the tendon, but it's just uh, uh, injury to the bone. And, it, and this was very painful. And so this is called osteitis pubis. Uh, but again, th these are really trabecular injuries from uh, recurrent stress uh, to the bone. Uh, why don't we, let's, let's stop here and we'll pick up, uh, uh, here tomorrow. Okay. Oh, wow.